Okay, thank you very much, Marielle, and thank you for organizing the masterclass. And great, we've got uh, 484 people registered, which is fantastic. And I'm sure they're coming from about, um, I was gonna say about 400 different countries, but we don't have that many, so probably about 100 different countries, knowing MSM. And welcome to Leadership in Crisis Masterclass. Now, many of you have been to MSM and have been students uh, with us and we miss our face-to-face -face classes, we miss our building, uh, but however, there will be a time when things get back to normal again, we hope, but a different kind of normal. Uh, depends on our leadership skills. So we're, we, we're all facing such a global, huge pandemic and the coronavirus has been, has changed our lives completely. Many of our workplaces are, are closed, but they're reopening slowly and carefully, including MSM. We're all working from home. This is where I'm working from. It's rather nice. Um, I'm staying with friends at the moment. I can't get back home because the airport where I live is closed. But anyway, that's a long story. But some of us are just looking at a blank wall all day, which is not very inspirational. So our lives have changed in our workplaces big time. Now, as leaders of our tasks are now totally different than they were. We are leading our teams. Now, in the old days, BC, pre-COVID crisis, CEO stood for Chief Executive Officer. Nowadays, we may say that CEO stands for Chief Empathy Officer because we need to empathize with the challenges of our teams. We might say that after COVID, we don't know when that will be, uh, it's not, fit, not over yet, we have the chief exploring the unknown officer, but our jobs as leaders have changed completely. I'd like you to remember this little red uh, word with the heart in the O, respond. Above all, as leaders, we must be positive. We have to do our jobs, we are executives, but we have to have empathy with everybody who works for us. And in the future, we'll be exploring. Now, we may have some people from uh, China or who can speak Chinese or read Chinese characters. And many of them may know already that uh, the Chinese word for crisis includes two characters, two Chinese characters. One stands for danger and one for opportunity. So, uh, and I've heard people say crisis is a terrible thing to waste because in a crisis, all kinds of exciting things can happen and a uh, crisis can be the mother of invention, like, like a combat situation. And uh, okay, uh, it's well known coming from the, as a biblical quotation, cometh the hour, cometh the man or woman, because uh, when the hour of crisis comes, then leaders come to the fore. Now, the people who are working for you, members of your team, they're in lockdown right now. And how is it for them being at home? Are they on their own? Are they with their loved ones? Are they overwhelmed with too much work? What are their issues? And this situation we're in right now has been very big for diversity and inclusion because now when you go to work on Zoom or Skype or whatever it is, you are bringing your whole, whole self to work because it could be that in the past, your you know, managers didn't really know so much about the staff's personal situation, their children, their relationships, their dependents. But now it's all, it's all well known because the chief empathy officer needs to know more about the challenges of their staff because they have got bigger things to worry about than their key performance indicators and their normal job tasks. They could be very depressed and demotivated with many people having demands on their time and they have inadequate resources. They may be mothers with, or even fathers with small children who they have to look after during lockdown and doing their job as well. And one of our colleagues at Maastricht School of Management, he was in a faculty meeting and he was uh, bathing his three-year-old son at the same time uh, because everybody's now who's got small children has got different responsibilities. 
It may also be that you have uh, old uh, relatives, parents who are uh, affected negatively by the coronavirus and this is a source of worry for you. And here's, here's me and my partner with his 94 year old mother who is in a care home. He can't visit her, the care home is closed. Uh, all the staff of the care home are wearing uh, full PPE. So um, his mum who, who is suffering from dementia thinks she's, she's been surrounded by astronauts or welders or these weird people in all these masks. And she's very confused and very upset. And of course he is as her son as well. So we have to bear all this in mind. Now, working from home. Now, uh, is it new for you? Is it new for your people? Have they ever done it before? And one of the first classes I taught for MSM after the lockdown was in Hungary, our partner there. And many of the students worked for a major bank in Hungary and their bank didn't allow working from home. But now everybody is. So that has changed the way you manage your people because they're all separate from you. Do they have a routine? Uh, do they have a, a place where they can work effectively? And how are they managing in this lockdown situation? And are they able to discipline themselves and keep motivated? Now, this is a very tough one. Are they still being very um, happy and managing their relationships? Uh, they have to help themselves before they can help others. They've got to be in a good frame of mind before they can do their jobs. Okay, now, now the whole COVID crisis has been a leveling experience for many of us. And if we're used to working remotely, and if we all have uh, ability to use all the new technology, uh, Zoom, Skype, Teams, and all this, this new functionality that we've been exploring, we have an advantage. And many people have been left behind in the new technology and now they're having to speed up really fast. And people who were previously resistant to use technology have got, now got a big incentive. Now, uh, as a leader, we need to help all our team to be able to use the new technology effectively. So crash courses in Zoom and the other tools have become very important. Okay, now I've just, I just attended a virtual conference and talking about some of the uh, issues and problems which employees are suffering from the, the COVID crisis, employees and students, and what, what is it they miss the most of being locked down and not be able to go to their workplace. They miss face-to-face -face collaboration. It's easier to work together. They find it hard to keep interested in their work without the stimulus of others. They lose motivation because work to working in the Zoom environment, you have to be very self-motivated and not everybody has got this ability. Again, we have to be responsive as the chief empathy officer or or empathy manager and what are our priorities and trying to be an empathetic leader in a crisis we mustn't hide the truth we mustn't pretend that it's not difficult we, we can't say that everything is perfect even though we need to be upbeat and positive listening 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 what are the problems that people are suffering from we need to be authentic, accessible, present. We'll need to do hundreds more emails every day. We'll have to be on Zoom for hours and hours all day with our job of helping people to adjust. And sometimes we may find that actually our relationships with people are improving because we're spending more time actually talking to people and asking them how they are managing in the crisis. Okay. Now, many people are asking, is this a mega trend change? Is this a game changer permanently? Or is it just an incident? Are we going to go back to normal? Or the new normal? This is a very uh, overused expression these days. Or will the situation never be quite normal again? And what would be lasting changes? And it could be that some of the technologies that we use 
mean we will carry on using them and it could be that um, as business people we don't go on so many uh, business trips incentive holidays uh, go up as visits to customers because we found another way we can talk to them on um, Skype and Zoom and other channels, and that will become more acceptable. But those who are good at building relationships and doing business in this remote environment will be the winners, and especially in the field of leadership, where we'll be able to uh, build this relationship in a more effective way. Now, as you all know, as many of you will know, Maastricht School of Management is a very multicultural environment. And we as teachers at MSM and, and leaders, uh, I'm department head and obviously I'm teaching leadership and I'm working with many leaders and doing research on leadership all the time. We're very conscious that people of different cultures respond to leaders in different ways and have different needs. So people who come from High power distant cultures, and many of you do. Uh, the US and the UK are very low power distant, but Africa, India, Middle East, many of these cultures are quite different. And these higher power distant cultures are used to having more direction from leaders. They look up to their leaders for help and guidance. So, therefore, those leaders have to be more present, give them more more guidance, give them more hands-on support. Now, collectivist cultures like to be in groups. And for these people, they like to be in an environment where they can interact with their groups. So these people are finding it harder to be isolated. And some people are isolated with their families. They are the lucky ones. Many people are isolated on their own and far from home. So how are they going to respond to their leaders? Many cultures are high uncertainty avoiding. They don't like the unknown. They, like what they want guidance. They want to know what they can do. Many are relationship oriented. They miss their friends and families. They, they, they're not so task oriented. If you're task oriented, then you can just get on with your job. You don't expect to have people around supporting you but it's easier for you, but you're not, not like everybody. Now, effective cultures like to show their feelings and they're warm and they're expressive. They find it very hard to go around wearing face masks and keep socially distant and not hug and kiss all their friends. And I'm talking to you right now from, from Spain, from Tarragona near Barcelona, and the Spanish people here um, are very uh, huggy and kissy and warm people. And I see them walking down the street wearing their face masks. They have to wear their mask as a government ruling. But they just, sometimes they're even, they can't help themselves. They, they take the mask off and they hug and kiss their friends and they put it back on again quickly. Uh, so it's really hard for them. So we can appreciate that effective cultures are suffering more than the neutral cultures. Also, feeling in and out of control. Some people like to feel they are controlling their life. And in this lockdown situation, we don't have a lot of control. Uh, you know, other people are controlling what happens in our daily life, and this can be hard for us. Okay, now, many of you will have heard of this expression, living in a VUCA world. And at all classes on leadership, we talk about VUCA. Uh, VUCA stands, as many of you will know, stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Now, this concept was invented by Warren Bennis in the 1980s. But boy, are we now facing much more volatility, much more uncertainty, much more complexity, and much more ambiguity than ever before. So, if we're gonna be VUCA leaders, we've got, to, we've got to lead in a VUCA way. We've got to lead with vision, with, uh, so that we can help our people to understand what the future will be like. 
we've got to try to give them some kind of certainty and I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, we've got to lead with, un with understanding, with empathy, understanding their unique situation. We've got to lead with clarity, try and help people to understand what they can and can't do, what's possible, what's not possible right now. And above all, probably, we've got to be agile, lead with agility, with uh, flexibility. And we've got, we can't keep saying, no, no, we can't do that. We've got to say, let's think about how we can do that in the current situation. Okay, and this is a Harvard Business School um, research. Okay, now McKinsey, well known as a, a major consulting firm, they've also jumped on the bandwagon suggesting ways in which leaders can engage, inspire, mobilize their followers in demanding circumstances. And McKinsey created this concept of centered leadership. And this was a little while ago now, but this is even more relevant now than when it was uh, developed. And here we can talk about um, five elements of the centered leadership. Now, first of all, we've got to, as leaders, focus on the meaning of what we do. We've got to find value and inspiration in what we do to get our team inspired. And for us at MSM, it's bringing leadership and management to, to the world as best we can to help people do their jobs better and be more successful. Uh, other companies have their own missions and visions, and we have to focus on those inspiring causes. As, uh, for the healthcare people, that's not difficult because they are trying to bring health and uh, hope to the population. But what is our inspiring cause that we're trying to get everybody to follow? Uh, positive framing of everything. Trying to see the opportunities. Remember, crisis means danger, but opportunity. Connecting. We'd be building networks and every day we'll be doing far more Zoom calls and far more emails and WhatsApp messages uh, because this is our way of networking. We need to engage everybody, despite the risks and despite the problems. We've got to find ways to manage our energy, keep ourselves going and manage the energy of our team. And I was talking to one of our, our graduates who's leading a, a big team of people working in human resources um, in around the world for a big American a company and he said that one of his direct reports has three children under five years old uh, which she has to look after and okay maybe she can only work three or four hours a day but other members of the team have got more energy and more strength because they haven't got so many restrictions and we have to manage the energy of ourselves and of our team Okay, now I said before about trying to help our team with some certainty and vision, and some companies are able to do this. Now, I was talking just now about the big data company and our graduate who works there, uh, it's called Cloudera. Um, they want to return to the workplace by the end of October 2020, and they have announced this. Now, uh, other friends of ours and one of our students who's visiting now, um, who's, who's present with us now, uh, works for Johnson Controls, and they have said that uh, in February 2021 is the plan to open the factories. And there's a picture of one of the smart buildings that Johnson Controls has, has developed. And uh, people like this certainty, even though it's a long way off, it gives you something to think about and to plan for. And if you just keep telling your staff, well, we'll maybe think about it in a month from now, that may not be working anymore. Now, at the beginning of the virus, if we can you know, we think back to March uh, this year, many people were, were told by their bosses, uh, we, we can't plan anything now, we've got to think about it in a month's time. Well, maybe May, you know, March, April, May, that was the kind of thing people were being told. But now, we need a bit more certainty than that. And companies are now starting to look at a greater degree of certainty 
in their planning. Now, I'd like to share with you a couple of stories about crisis leaders. And I've picked a couple of crisis leaders who, in my opinion, seem to be doing a competent job. Uh, there are probably many hundreds and thousands more out there, but these are some kind of famous ones. And this, this person, um, Mr. Arnie Sorensen, is a CEO of Marriott Hotels. Now, the hotel business has taken a huge hit, as probably all of you will realize. And, um, and this, this gentleman, he, he also recently had some medical issue and um, he came on the YouTube videos and, uh, to give a very uh, um, caring message about how all the staff are suffering and they never saw him without any hair before because I think he had uh, a very bad medical condition and lost his hair and that quite shocking to his staff but as far as he's concerned most important thing is that he shows himself and is present and uh, is giving people a positive message and when he was uh, talking in his YouTube video and if you if you look up YouTube you look up Arnie Sorensen CSO CEO Marriott Hotels you can watch his five minute broadcast to his staff and I recommend this this is very motivational and he talks about the the huge concern for um, staff and their relatives who are suffering from the virus because obviously Marriott Hotels employs thousands and thousands of people and this company 92 years old so it's nearly a hundred year old company and is facing the biggest challenge that it's ever faced in its lifetime. They've suffered up to 90% decline in businesses uh, around the world, and their costs have had to be reduced. They've had to freeze hiring. Many companies have to do this. Uh, see, the CEO has renounced um, collecting his paycheck for the rest of the year, and this is sending out a message to all the staff who have suffered reduced pay, that um, the, the boss has to re accept reduced pay too. And their salaries are very huge. So this can make a difference. And they've got a bit of money to fall back on. And a lot of people working in companies with having suffered pay cuts haven't got so much money to fall back on. At Marriott, the directors have had their pay cut by 50%. And they have done this willingly. That again is sending out a positive vibe to all the employees. They've had to cut lots of their properties um, in terms of cl closures and um, closed whole floors, F and B. Obviously, no new hotels are opening. But at the end of Mr. Sorensen's uh, five-minute talk, he is trying to be very positive and saying, "We want to welcome the world again." And you can see that um, companies like Marriott are very desperate to do this. And um, they're not the only ones. Another company, oh, before we leave um, Mr. Sorensen, uh, at the bottom of his YouTube video, some of the people watching it put, put comments. And I thought, I thought this, this was quite um, important. One of them said, uh, this is real leadership in the face of adversity. And that Mr. Sorensen was very humble and his comments were very heartfelt. And you could just feel his compassion and empathy. And this person said, I think the politicians should take note because maybe some of them are not being as empathetic as some of the corporate leaders. And his presentation was very touching and sincere. See how you feel about it. Okay, now another CEO who um, I felt was doing a good job of being a chief empathy officer and as a good role model for us was um, Greg Foran, who's the CEO of Air New Zealand. So if you think that hotels are, having, are in bad shape, what about airlines? And he just started a new job just before the coronavirus struck. And his first 100 days in the new job were certainly pretty hectic. Now, uh, Air New Zealand is not the biggest um, airline in the world, but it did, does have a significant um, revenue. Uh, uh, with um, So um, New Zealand dollars are a bit less than a, a euro, um, about half of an English pound and you know, less than a dollar. But um, still a lot of money you're talking about here. 
and they were flying 18 million customers. Now it's a very small fraction. New Zealand has done quite well. Many of you are watching the virus uh, progress, see that New Zealand has opened up again, but they have closed their borders and they're far enough away from the rest of the world to be safe. But if they open those borders up, they're afraid that the virus will strike again. Now, what I liked about the Air New Zealand CEO's message, and perhaps you, it will appeal to some of you guys as well, was his um, strategy. And he called it survive, revive and thrive. And he has this um, 800 day plan. And they're still in the survival mode. But he aims to hit revive in a couple of months from now, in September 2020. He also um, is hoping to, um, to hit the thrive mode by um, August 2022. I think that's right, because I've got the pictures. Yep, that's right, covering parts of my slides. And he expects that there'll be a total overhaul of the cost base of the airline and during the revive phase, the airline will be much smaller than it was before. And, but by Thrive, by August 2022, uh, he hopes that the, the airline can reach 70% of its former size. He's taking this opportunity to have a new focus on the airline, be more digitalized. And a lot of, um, uh, of, our, of people who are working in digitalization are um, actually benefiting from COVID because there's been a big upsurge in interest in digitalization and many organizations are making huge strides forward in this area much more than ever before. And, and New Zealand also wants to focus more on quality, lower its cost, improve its customer service. And they're using this as an opportunity. So um, survive, revive, thrive, I'd like you all think, to think about your organizations and your leadership job and which mode that you're in and how you can get through this period. Okay, now the latest thing we're discussing and I'd like to, to recommend to all of you this Harvard Business Review article, a very recent one, 24th of June this year, uh, which is about helping your people through re-entry re anxiety. Now, uh, many of you have been reading and sending out uh, documents, manuals, uh, videos, you name it, about re-entry to the workplace. And we mustn't just focus on logistics and arrangements for wearing face masks and sanitization stations and switching off the air conditioning and making sure that there's um, all the surfaces are clean. There is much more to re-entry than this and leaders must address employee anxiety about their safety, the future of, an organize, of the organization, the future of their jobs. Will they have jobs to go back to? And uh, you know and for um, students graduating, will you have jobs to go to? So this is a, uh, a valuable article and it covers some important main points. Make the well-being of people your top priority. Share accurate, timely and transparent information which can help people to uh, understand the risks and to be positive and to make the best of their re-entry uh, experience. Now, it could be that your government uh, is um, announcing public health measures. Now, your company should announce them too, and they should be very uh, positive and perhaps better than the, the uh, local uh, environment is suggesting, uh, but at least uh, based on the minimum, insisted by your, your country. And you should implement some training for supervisors and leaders who feel they don't have the knowledge and skills to help to, to be empathy officers. Uh, you need to build resilience, not just resilience to the, the germs and the virus, but resilience to uh, 
attacks on your levels of motivation, your energy levels, your positivity levels, and flexibility in working routines. As schools, um, play groups, uh, old people's homes, all these things are suffering from different arrangements which we have to fit in with. And again, think about the respond uh, with the heart in the middle, and that's your job as a leader. Okay, and here's our, our school, and we really hope that we can go back there again soon. Now, I'd like to, to finish off by talking about your own leadership skills. And can you be an effective leader in a crisis situation? Do you have what it takes to be a crisis leader? Now, you've been doing this for some time, perhaps, but it could be that the crisis gets worse. We don't know. And you may have to focus more on this. And it could be that your big boss says to you, now, could you be the crisis leader? because we need more help here. Now, what are your leadership skills? They depend on five issues. And I was talking about this in my MBA class. So um, anyone who's, um, who's listening, who um, was in my MBA class on leadership, you've heard this before, but I think there are quite a lot of other people who haven't been in it. So um, what are your um, personal preferences and context? Um, leadership, basic leadership depends on seven basic rules and they haven't changed too much. And your leadership also depends on your own personal goals for being a leader. Okay, now these um, came from this um, uh, recent book of, um, I was a co-author of this and I'm, um, lots of the materials I've taken are from this book. And if anyone's interested, I can send you some um, extracts from this book. Uh, a PDF, and you can write to me at my email address on the MSM website, jones at msm.nl. Okay, so the five issues which affect your style as a leader. First of all, it's your personality, behaviors, and preferences. And above all, as a leader, you have to be authentic. Now, I said that at the beginning of this lecture, and I'm very happy to say it again, because you can't pretend to be something that you're not. And your personality, behaviors, and preferences are very clear, clearly affect your leadership style. The people that you lead also impact on the way you should operate and the way, you, the, the way you, to be effective. What are their motivation levels? What are their experience levels and their diversity? Where are they coming from? Age, gender, uh, background, experience, ethnicity, all those things make a difference. The task you have to do. And at the moment, that's been affected big time by the virus. And OK, you may have short term issues, but we don't know how long this virus is going to go on for. The challenges you are facing. now. Uh, hardly anybody is in just ordinary continuity mode at the moment. Everybody is coping with change, heaping upon you all the time, left, right and centre. So you've got to cope with that. Good times, bad times. And many of us are about to face a big economic fallout. In fact, all of us probably are going to face that. And that is going to affect our leadership style. So those are five issues which take it, we need to take into account in managing in this crisis. Seven basic rules of leadership. Okay, we need a plan and a strategy for what we're going to do. And that's why I talked about some companies which are trying to implement plans, trying to implement strategies. Survive, revive, thrive. Okay, allocate tasks. Know your team members, see who's ready, willing and able. Remember, some people can't do as much work as they used to do because they've got several children to look after as well as do their job. Think about logistics and resources. Maybe we have less money to spend. We are more restrained and restricted. We have to keep briefing and communicating regularly. Not once a month, once a week, once every couple of days, communicate. We need to set an example as the leader Okay, we don't all have to lead from the front. We can be quiet leaders, we can delegate, but we need to be present and helpful 
and able to support our team. Communication all the time, you can't say that too often. And a happy team is an efficient team and an efficient team is a happy team. And I'm not the first person to say that, but it's true all along. Now, what are your goals, personal goals, for being a leader? Now, if you're wanting to get to the top of the tree and achieve a senior position, have a lot of status and fame, um, this may not be the best time for you. But if, number two, your task in life, the way you see it, is to help others, be self-actualized, add value to the world, leave a legacy for the future. Now, your time has come because this is a great opportunity for you to help others as much as you can. And I've heard about people who are in lockdown situations and they can't go to work, they're, they're furloughed. And what do they do? They organize others. And one of our um, former students who's in um, India right now, he um, spent his lockdown period building a huge tank for water supplies so that people don't have to go so far to collect water. And, you know, my partner, he, um, he's a professional sailor. His ship was on the hard. He couldn't, um, uh, the boatyard was closed. He couldn't work. So, but um, he likes being on his motorbike. So what did he do? He volunteered to deliver on his motorbike the pharmaceutical products for uh, needy people who couldn't get out to the pharmacy to collect their prescription. And sometimes he was off four or five times a day and he was happy on his motorbike and he was doing a good job. And, you know, if, so, if you're a future employer or your boss says to you, what did you do during the lockdown? Then how you made the best of this situation says something about you. Okay, now many of us want to be leaders so they can be uh, comfortable, have more money, have a nice quiet, quiet life, a nice house and, and have material goods. Well, that's a bit under threat at the moment. Although um, let's hope that the economy revives again in due course. Okay, now if you're gonna be a, a crisis leader, you need to know what is the best case scenario of, of what's happening what's the worst case scenario and what's most likely. And when I was in headhunting and I used to headhunt crisis leaders, I looked for people who had, uh, who were willing, who were able, willing and able and ready to fulfill these job objectives. So crisis leaders need to keep the organization afloat. They need to retain their, their customers and suppliers. They need to um, adapt the business to new demands, look for new growth. There are new opportunities for growth everywhere. And if any of you came to the masterclass that um, my colleague David Dingley gave uh, recently, he talked about entrepreneurs who had fantastic new growth opportunities and were doing very well uh, adapting their businesses to the lockdown. And he mentioned um, um, a ballet school where nobody could go anymore to learn ballet, but they had uh, videos and they had on Zoom and um, the kids at home trying to learn how their ballet, ballet steps could watch on Zoom, which was very entrepreneurial. And we have um, um, uh, a pizza van um, near where I used to live in, in England and the pizza van, which has a pizza oven in it, uh, couldn't go to uh, visit the pub anymore because the pub was closed, but people would still come out in their cars to the pizza van and his business had doubled. So new growth opportunities everywhere. We need to make that new strategy. We need to get buy-in from the stakeholders. Okay, what kind of personality is good for a crisis leader? They need to be collaborative and accommodating, not avoiding. They've got to make decisions. There's anything, worse, there's anything worse than making a bad decision, and that's making no decision at all. Okay, ideally you make a right decision, but better than making none. Uh, got to be good at problem solving, coordinating, be a generalist, turn your hand to everything. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. Assess and monitor risk, be a strategist, be transformational, seize the moment, understand urgency. 
The kind of experiences we'd be looking for in a crisis manager may be somebody who's worked in a disaster area. You know, perhaps somebody who's worked for MSF, you know, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Red Cross, or uh, in a combat situation. We would ask people, tell us about the biggest challenge you ever faced. What was it? Maybe this coronavirus is some of the biggest challenges we've ever faced. Um, have they had a uh, short-term success mindset and can make quick progress? Can they strategize in an emergency situation? Can they brief a team? Are they good at building positive team culture? Are they willing to take responsibility? That might be one of the most important elements. And in my book in on key concepts of leadership, I identified 33 leadership dichotomies. And here I've picked out in red the ones that I think are the most valuable for a crisis leader. Being accommodating, being intuitive, being participative in your leadership style, being involved in what everybody is doing. Okay, behind the scenes or lead from the front, but be present, be supportive. Broad-based, be a generalist. Cope with change. Okay, be a leaderholic, be on, be, be hands-on as a leader. Have a, adopt a coaching style, mentoring and supportive. You may, your staff may be equals. You may have still some prima donnas there. You've got to manage all of them. You've got to be focused on the company and helping everybody to pull together for the survival of your organization. Cooperative, developmental. This is a big opportunity for all of us to become stronger. We've got to lead diversity. Everybody's gonna be different in the way they cope. East or West, we will all have our own job to do. Many of us will be, have the opportunity to lead volunteers, people who are jobless at the moment, volunteering to help, get them help, get them helping. We need all the help we can get. EQ is more important than IQ. Generalists, extrovert or introvert, we've all got our job to do. We could be oriented in any way that we know. Worldly, the world is very different goal-oriented, here and now we have to solve the problems, but we build a legacy for our future. We have to be people-oriented. And finally, thank you for your attention for this time, uh, we need to be a shaper-driver. We need to build relationships. We need to inspire our followers. And okay, this situation may be interim, but we don't know how long for. We need to reflect on our leadership style and accept feedback. We need to think about a project. There may be an end in sight, but we don't know. We've got to think micro, on a micro level, all our staff, all our team need help. Nurturing, and we also, above all nurturing, and think of the principles and the cause and the values of our organizations. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention and I would be very happy to take any questions. So I'll hand over to um, Marielle. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Thank you for the interesting presentation. I've got a lot of good remarks that they are very happy about the practical presentation. Um, I don't have so many questions, only a few, but I will read them out uh, to you. Uh, Noah made a remark that uh, said, as a leader, how we're going to deal with related opposite issues that affect human life, like health and economy aspects in crisis. Okay. Health and the economy. Well, again, the chief empathy officer has got a lot to do with trying to help everybody to... Uh, cope with the health crisis and the first thing that every chief empathy officer should do when they talk to their their staff is to say you know how is your lockdown how are your family do you have any incidents in your family of the virus or about any of your friends and if you if you know that any of your staff have anybody affected then every time you talk to them you should make a point of asking so 
uh, and you know, does everybody have the health care they need? Does everybody have um, medicines and a support? Because obviously other people have other health issues at the same time. Uh, leaders and the economy, uh, once we've made sure that everybody is, is uh, healthy and surviving or those who are not have got the help they need, then we uh, need to address the, the fact that the economic downturn is going to be a big one and we're going to have to uh, rein in spending, cut those business trips, cut those um, unnecessary expenses. And this is an opportunity for many organizations to be much more focused on being economical and not wasting resources. And in the end, this may be a very um, positive situation, but we've seen quite a lot of economic downturns recently, 2008. So this is not nothing new for us. We don't know how big this current, this current one's going to be, it could be bigger uh, than before. So let's all uh, try to be upbeat and into survival mode before we can, um, we can thrive for the future. Okay, we have more questions coming in. Also remarks. Um, Fatima made a remark that uh, leaders also must empower others to direct many aspects of the organization's crisis response. Yes, yes, Fatima's got a very good point. And also one point that I should have made that I forgot, but she reminded me, is that a crisis leader, when the crisis is over, they have to step down. So meanwhile, they have to empower others to take their place. Because somebody who may be very good at handling a crisis, very decisive, uh, very dynamic, may not be the right person for when the crisis moments have passed and things have settled down a bit. So empowering others to take other roles for the future will be very important. And a leader during this period whose, whose team members become empowered and then become pro are promoted and gain confidence and maturity afterwards, then that, that crisis leader is doing a good job, I would say. Because we always define the success of a leader by the success of the team members. And that may be more and more relevant and important than ever. Okay. Hope that answers your question, Fatima. Um, I have another question from Anna Catalina. Maybe you remember her. She is an alumna from Amazon, and uh, she also thank you. Hi, Anna. Yes, I was looking <laughs> at her picture. It just went when I first started. Yeah, thank you, Anna, for coming. She's very inspired by your speech, but she also has a question because she arrived in the Netherlands one month before the crisis outbreak and she's now without a job. But she really would like to have your advice if it would be good to join some voluntary group in order to practice being most superficial possible because now she is out of job and she doesn't have the opportunities to do so. Right. And you're, you're in the Netherlands, Anna Catalina. Yes. And... Um, uh, I think the best thing for you to do would be to um, talk to our careers department at um, MSM, to Hermina. And if you write to me, I'll send on your, um, your, your query to Hermina and I de she definitely will answer you because she'll have a lot of ideas. Uh, I'm not in the Netherlands right now. and I'm, I'm not very often there and I don't know the situation there, but I know there will be a lot of things that you could do and things which could help your career in the future. So if you send me your CV, uh, especially with your language skills and things like this, then I'll send it to the right place and make sure that um, you get an answer there. And um, it's very positive to want to volunteer and it will give you confidence and, and it, it keep busy and keep positive and that's all a good thing. Okay, thanks for coming. Good. Next one. Questions keep on coming now. Um, Here's a question, since the situation is so uncharted and unpredictable, giving clear or definite instructions and targets to the teams could give sense of false hope to the team, and even worse, lose the credibility as a leader. How do a leader overcome that? Right. Yeah, this is a difficult one. Um, we have to be upbeat and positive, but we nevertheless must be realistic, and those two things are a bit contradictory. And even though something like um, getting jobs for the future, 
and um, not having a pay cut or something like this or being able to get promotion, be able to make more money in the future. These things may be uh, difficult for managers to and leaders to answer because the, the, the answer may be negative. But uh, nevertheless, if we think more long term, then we have to think about uh, the increased uh, um, ability and confidence and uh, experience that we will have as a result of all of this. And that maybe it's a long term thing, but in the longer term, uh, maybe the world will be a better place, we'll be more successful, we'll have a better career. But we just have to have faith in the longer term and and overcome short term difficulties and keep that long term horizon uh, on the radar screen to keep us uh, positive and try to build on the positives and try to uh, offset the negatives. OK, be realistic, but not depressive and try to nurture the optimism of your team in spite of all the difficulties and help them to find some strength. And it could be that many people get um, depressed because of loneliness, isolation, um, uh, illness, which may not be the virus, but uh, some illness that related to being isolated. Uh, and perhaps they don't get enough exercise because they're locked down. So. One good thing is things is like exercise and yoga and some spiritual connections and all these things can help people. So if we have to encourage our team to look for those strengths. Okay. Um, next one is uh, how do you balance between keeping the company or business afloat and being empathetic, empathetic to its employees? Oh, afloat and empathetic. Right. Okay, in a way they're interconnected. Um, you can't say, oh, I'm going to spend 50% of my time being empathetic to my employees and 50% of my time trying to keep the business going because uh, you're the team members being empowered and positive and motivated will help to keep the business afloat by coming up with new initiatives and new ideas to help the company. And if you could start some kind of incentive scheme, maybe your rewards can't be very um, uh, monetary, but nevertheless, um, how can we uh, think of new ideas to keep the organization going and reward people for thinking of those new ideas? And, you know, uh, it start doing a suggestion scheme, get everybody involved in how can we keep the business afloat? And how can we make uh, temporary uh, cost savings and get everybody empowered to think about those things? And so at the same time, uh, being empathetic, being engaging, being inspirational, but also trying to keep that business going at the same time. So they're mutually um, interconnected, those two objectives. Okay. Um, I got a question that schools in the United States are being pushed to reopen by government where many school leaders feel it's not the right time. How does a leader on a school environment lead on this situation? Wow. So many of the leaders are a bit reluctant, but nevertheless, the government is saying, OK. The best thing really is to abide by all the health and safety uh, requirements as much as possible. Uh, I think, oh yeah, one of our, I can see a picture of one of our participants tonight wearing um, uh, PPE while he's looking at his Zoom screen. Uh, Joseph, that may be a little bit excessive, um, but if you're in a room with other people, uh, be, show, show your example by wearing your, your PPE. Oh, I think I've, I've put mine, on, I've got mine in my, in my bag, not here. But, um, and, you know, um, washing hands and following all the practices and starting uh, each of your um, sessions where you're meeting your team and perhaps each of your class classes with um, uh, hygiene, uh, cleanliness um, standards and also uh, re reiterating the importance of social distancing and uh, looking out for any um, symptoms which anyone may have and trying to um, warn them 
and keep everybody alert. This was for the, the slogan we had in UK when I was there, be alert and make, sh and make sure that everybody is following the PPE rules and set a good example. Uh, see that article about re-entry anxiety and follow some of the guidelines on that. And um, that's very easily available by HBR. And um, if anybody can't find it, I'm very happy to send them a, a link so they can they can see that. Um, got another question. In crisis, when leaders fail, what do they do different from the normal situation then? Oh, uh, a failing crisis. Some leaders could be successful when it's not a crisis because they're good at um, continuity and they're able to keep uh, and they're able to to cope very well in a situation where uh, it's fairly normal whereas um, um, those leaders may fail in a crisis situation because it's not business as usual so leaders who like to say um, let's let's carry on uh, things are the same as the, as always may be seen as being in denial now and they're not being successful in a crisis uh, and a leader who uh, is very hands-off and doesn't talk to their team very often uh, maybe in a normal situation that's all right the team just gets on with it but in crisis maybe they need to communicate more and they need to send out more than a monthly newsletter they need to sort of be uh, talking to people and be more uh, more present maybe to be seen more because maybe people need their leaders more, especially in the high um, power distant context. So it could be that uh, the crisis puts new pressure on leaders to behave in quite a different way. But then having said that, when the crisis is over, we need a different style of leader who can rebuild people's confidence in a very positive way and put perhaps more emphasis, even more emphasis on the empathy side. Okay. Okay. Um, any advice how to address friction in the team due to uneven distribution of responsibilities and tasks? As you mentioned, many team members are not able to perform at the same level. Oh. Okay. So, so a lack of balance of, of tasks. Yes. Now, some people will say, um, I have to work harder than the others because I don't have children. And um, just because I don't have children, it doesn't mean that um, I should do more work. Um, uh, and it's not fair. Uh, that does show a certain amount of um, immaturity and lack of support for the colleagues. Uh, but nevertheless, there will be people who will see this. So uh, we have to, as, as a leader, we have to focus on flexibility. And we might we might say to some of our um, team members who are saying, oh, I'm having to work much harder than anybody else. I'm, I feel really put upon. You may say, well, uh, if you can achieve your the what we're your objectives uh, and you can help others who are less able to help than you are, then uh, when the crisis is over, this will be recognized. And so showing more recognition of those who are working extra hard and pulling their weight in an extra good way. And we might also have to be very cognizant of the fact that conflicts arise because people are tired, irritated, uh, uh, suffering from isolation, uh, depressed, miserable, and we have to uh, bear that in mind and say and, and say to them in an empathetic way, um, okay, I know why you, you're feeling upset. Everybody's under strain. Everybody's suffering from the extra pressures. But we have to try to cope. And, and it's, it doesn't help if we are uh, in conflict with our... Um, uh, team members it doesn't uh, add anything to the achievement of our goals we have to work together rather than separately so it's um, trying to pull the team together and some people are good at being team workers but and they're good at handling a team and good at being empathetic but then they they have problems with being decisive in a conflict so in a way a conflict leader 
is a kind of contradiction in terms because this person's got to have empathy but also has got to be able to be decisive and when a leader is being decisive they're going to cause conflicts in their team but they have to wear two hats the decision maker and the empathetic person and keep marrying them together to try to keep that team able to function and reduce conflicts and say to everybody look you know everybody is in like a combat zone it's like a war on it's the war against the virus and we've got to bury our differences something like this another one will the world be the same in terms of globalization after or during COVID? i think leadership is facing a big challenge to cope with the multicultural challenges during the COVID. different views on COVID. how can we overcome this right um and there's two questions there really um i was just um this afternoon watching a very very good uh, video from the economist magazine and the economist editor was um answering in a q a and um, about the world economy and the impact of of covid and she was asked this very same question uh, what's going to be the impact of globalization and um, um she felt that although there may be temporary um, uh, uh, reductions in the level of globalization and companies and uh, people trading that it could be a, a temporary glitch and going back to and all the, pro the progress we've made in globalization um, should not be negated and she sees the signs that even though it's a temporary glitch that uh, the globalized economy will um, keep going and in fact um, countries should be able to help each other with limited resources globalization uh, will continue but of course we don't know all about the economic uh, outfall um, of the, that situation at the moment now there's a second question here about different views about the virus and um, myself like many others of people others of you have been watching that uh, uh johns hopkins university website uh with the tracking of the virus and that there are very many differences between different countries and um i'm teaching a class at the moment uh for nichols college in america it's um a partner of maastricht school of management and we're talking about global the uh, global business the impact of the virus and many different countries are operating and uh, reacting in a different way um, however this is a global issue we can learn from each other uh, our problem is is that we we have all these global problems uh, hunger poverty pollution the environment coronavirus and we're all taking uh, national solutions which don't always work so we should follow global initiatives we should learn from each other and i recommend all of you to watch what other countries are doing uh, look how germany for example has been very uh, successful in handling this virus and if you look at the statistics that's very interesting what can we learn from that and i think we'll have best best case scenarios that we can study and uh, we can learn how different countries can react and of course we're we're looking at the progression of the virus so those countries some countries are now in the thick of it some countries like new zealand have come through it so have a look at what other countries are doing and take note and i hope our our government leaders are taking note of that as well as our corporate leaders i have another interesting one uh, does this brave new world in fact still need hierarchical leaders Mm. hierarchical leaders um i think the maybe the bad news is that leaders are becoming more hierarchical these days thanks to the virus and we're seeing a, a sort of tendency for more uh bossy um uh, hands-on uh totalitarian leaders coming to the fore uh, during this time we're seeing the state take greater control we're seeing less democracy as the virus is taking its grip 
and it's a bit scary how um, governments are implementing rules uh, which people have to follow in a very tough way and what many of us are worrying about and I was talking to um, a friend um, here in Spain this morning and she said that today, I mean, I didn't know because I can't understand Spanish, um, but the government announced today in Spain that everybody's got to wear their face mask as soon as they leave home, uh, not just in the shop, but all the time. And uh, otherwise you get arrested. And I went shopping this morning. I didn't wear a face mask except when I got to the shop. I didn't know, but I, oh, I know now. Um, the worry is, is that after the virus, will these governments stop being so tough? Will they allow more um, democracy again? Will they stop these emergency powers and go back to normal, whatever that means? Uh, countries are varying in this uh, degree, but I'm certainly quite concerned about the emergency powers that many countries, governments have adopted and how long these are going to last and the long-term impact on democracy uh, because at the, at the moment we're having less, um, fewer flat structures in governments and far more hierarchical structures with more power at the top. I think that's one to watch for all of us following the news during the virus and the knock-on effects of this on the leaders of our countries. A question, what is the most important component of effective crisis response? Ooh, uh, effective crisis response. Um, I, I, I asked this question of my partner who was um, in the services, in the armed services before, and he said it's a question about uh, worst, worst case scenario, best case scenario, and most likely scenario. And people want to know this. They need some certainty here. And so, uh, being decisive, making decisions, making plans whenever possible. I see this as being quite essential. A question with COVID-19, what impact do you think this would have on global supply chain? Understanding there are conversations around reshoring by many companies. Ooh, global supply chain is a very difficult one, uh, especially with, um, with borders closed, with um, flights grounded, and you, we're used to distributing by air. Uh, supply chains could be difficult. Uh, this is not my uh, exact field of expertise, um, but I've already seen how it's quite difficult. Transportation is challenged. So, uh, I can see that people are perhaps going to focus more on local products more. And certainly in um, UK, we had a problem with, um, it's perhaps a slightly related issue with the harvest of all the products. And we, we're not so much just worried about exporting the um, agricultural products, which are um, need harvesting right now, but we also had a, pro a problem with importing the laborers to actually harvest the products. And we had to have volunteers and people who weren't working to come and um, you know, um, pick the, the strawberries and pick the apples and dig up potatoes or whatever's needed doing. And of course, then we've got the problem of distributing them. So I think this is a bit of a nightmare for anybody who's in supply chain. Uh, good luck. Uh, because especially with the transport links being having problems and at the moment my my partner he's just uh, he's just come back from work um, working on a ship they have um, engines needing repairs they needed their their top engineers are in Belgium they had to come by road to Spain to help work on the the ship it would have been much easier if they'd flown but they couldn't so um, you have to find your way around the supply chain problems i hope that answers the question there's another question if you could maybe uh, elaborate on some possible buy-in opportunities from stakeholders during the survive stage from stakeholders okay so um think about who are the stakeholders of your organization, um, not just the, the staff, 
the um, customers, the suppliers, the um, governments, and say like for the airline industry, what are their stakeholders? It's the um, aircraft manufacturers, uh, the shareholders who um, invested in the airline, uh, the customers like the passengers. So it's sending out messages of support to get buy-in from the customers. And for some um, organizations, um, getting buy-in from customer stakeholders is very challenging because a lot of people say like they booked airline tickets, their, um, their, their flights were canceled and they're still waiting to get their refunds. And it's very hard to keep these people happy. And you haven't got any money because you've got no revenues. So you're trying to pay back these people um, who paid their money to the airline who booked flights and they can't take those flights and they're getting angry. Well, what can we do? So I think for some organizations, keeping their, their um, customers happy is harder than keeping their staff happy. And as a CEO, you've got to think about all these stakeholders. And meanwhile, um, a lot of the, the shareholders, the investors are not happy. So think about all your stakeholders and what do they need? The suppliers are suffering just as much as many companies because the companies are not buying the products. Okay, the suppliers in the foodstuffs and healthcare and pharmacy, they may be okay. But what about the uh, suppliers for the, um, you know, building trade uh, for uh, other industries which are on hold or much reduced right now? They're going to be suffering too. So I think it's empathy, being a chief empathy officer for all the stakeholders, not just, not just employees. I hope that helps. Okay. Another one, what would be the strategy to become a leader in a new country and within people of a language that you don't master yet? A leader in a new country? Yeah, with people of, that have a language that you don't master yet. Oh, people speaking, at, oh, with people in, um, oh. So you are um, working as a leader, but many of your staff and your people who report to you and maybe people in your team don't speak your language. Oh, this is a tough one. Um, I, I had this challenge myself when I worked in China because I um, didn't speak very good Chinese or very much at all. And my staff were all Chinese and some of them didn't speak any English. Uh, okay, uh, the best thing to do really is to find trusted uh, uh, subordinates, um, if you are uh, very close in a team who are bilingual, who can help you and not just rely on interpreters who just interpret the words and not the feeling, but people who can interpret uh, exactly what you intend and who understand the company rather than just be um, interpreting your language. So, and I think you should uh, get yourself learning that language as soon as possible. And I was watching um, um, a, a football um, leader, um, Bobby Robson. He was a football manager from the past, and he was sent to um, he was to send, sent to be manager of Barcelona. And the first thing he did was put himself in that language lab and um, panic learn Spanish or in Catalonian um, to get himself up to speed uh, as soon as possible. So um, you've got, when you learn a language, you learn an awful lot more than just a language. Um, even just that little example I had about Chinese, uh, what it means, what crisis means in Chinese, uh, that tells you a lot. You get under the skin of the culture when you get to the language. And I wish I was better at, at languages. Um, but uh, you need somebody with that um, uh, empathy to help you and help you to communicate in a very effective way. And you have to use a lot of visual things as well. Uh, use images. Uh, we don't just need words to communicate. Uh, pictures, uh, animations, especially with all the technology at our disposal, we can give a message in pictures as effectively as words. But um, and that's quite a hard question to answer, but anyway, uh, I hope that was a reasonable job. 
I have three more questions to go, and then I think we have to stop because okay. we're running out of time. Okay. Okay, three more questions. One is, uh, does the style or quality of leadership in the country's government determine the level of the COVID-19 crisis? Mm, right, good point. Another news item I was just watching um, today was all about how uh, the confidence people have in their leaders has an awful lot to do with how that country copes with the um, COVID crisis. And that also has a big, uh, big cultural overtones. Remember I talked before about power distance. In high power distant countries, people need to respect their leaders and they take their leaders decisions and rules very seriously. Uh, uh, countries which are low power distant, they need to respect their leaders and their leaders have a harder job. And in the UK, we certainly have suffered a lot by the uh, uh, perhaps lack of confidence of many people in our um, leadership. And that's, that's borne out by the fact that in the UK, and I'm quite glad not to be there anymore, I'm afraid, um, has been borne out by um, a big uh, uh, increases in um, the number of fatalities and cases. So the how, it, how, leadership is seen in a country has a lot to do with how people have managed this crisis situation. Okay, okay penultimate question. Yeah, I have a question from Nigeria. Uh, some leaders are not paying salary to staff members but donating billions of naira to the government in Nigeria to support the COVID-19 fight in many sectors. How do we relate this to compensate the workers for their time spent working? I don't know a huge amount about this one. Um, wow. So um, companies in Nigeria are paying the, the money to the government and not to their, their countries. But presumably the, the um, government is paying subsidies to the, the workers, a minimum wage and trying to keep them going. Uh, I don't know all the details about um, Nigeria. It sounds like a very hard one. Um, okay, uh, people can't live off air, they need to have some kind of support. Uh, okay, it looks like maybe their families will be more dependent. Uh, there'll be one person in the family maybe who's a breadwinner, and there'll be more and more people depending on that one breadwinner. And uh, um, maybe Nigeria is a little bit like um, India, we're staying at a friend's house at the moment, and he's an Indian guy, He's got people uh, uh, working on his land in India, and he says that each of those uh, the, the, those people, he's struggling to pay their salaries, but each person's got at least about, about 20 or 30 people depending on them for little bits of income to keep them going. And maybe that situation is similar in Nigeria. So people are depending on their families to support them. And... Um, that may be more and more important. So the governments will have to make sure that at least some people in the families have got some income and that the income is spread around so that uh, the worst cases of poverty, which are, I'm sure the poverty will increase with the COVID situation, that uh, people are looked after as best they can. And then the last one, um, how do you think the virus impacted the telecommunication sector since almost all employees are working from home now? I would have thought that telecoms is doing very well out of the virus. Um, internet suppliers, because we're all depending hugely on the internet. I mean, it's become our lifeline. And, you know, we need, we need, we need the internet like we need air to breathe now. So I would say that telecoms was a very good sector to be in. And you know, Zoom and Skype and all these tools are um, very profitable. If you've got shares in Zoom, you're doing very well. And all those people who are in IT, uh, I would encourage you all to try to develop new tools, uh, new um, techniques, new um, uh, software, 
uh, this is the way forward and it's going to keep keep going. People are not going to stop using all these things when the virus is over. They will continue using all these new tools and things that people are inventing and discovering. And here at MSM, uh, amongst the faculty, we've been learning new tools every day. And this, this learning curve will continue for us all, I think, for a long time to come. <laughs>